After 25 years in the fashion industry, I've realized that fashion is not really about the clothes, it's about the people. I'm Laura Van Root Poole, and this is What We Wore. Rupert Sanderson is an independent shoemaker who began his career in advertising, but always had a hunch he'd one day make shoes. I'm one of his first clients, and now he's been in business for over 20 years. We spoke to Rupert on his day off, gathering inspiration at a bookshop in Notting Hill. I'm glad to see you, even though I'm used to seeing you back in the day in small hotel rooms, which sounds more nefarious yes, than it is. I remember it well. <laughs> I remember it well. Those are the days. I know. I've been carrying the collection that long, probably 20, I mean, 15 years. I don't know how long. Did we, I mean, it was pre-Andrew. Uh, yeah, I think it was just with you. Yeah. Yeah. Where are you from? Well, I suppose I'd say London. Well, I, I grew up all over the place. I mean, I, I mean, I'm born in Penang in Malaysia. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was a sort of, you know, son of an army, son of a soldier. So, um, you know, we just moved around from Germany, the Far East to, you know, UK. Um, so, yeah, it was sort of a fairly peripatetic existence. Were you one of many siblings? Did you have siblings? I had one sister, one sister two years younger than me. I went to school, went to boarding school oh, in the UK. You say, a lot, lot of travelling. Actually, my, both sides of my family come from Cambridge, which is in East Anglia, which is, you know, one of those university towns. So, um, so yeah. So that, that, that's, I suppose, where I, where I sort of come from. But I spent, you know, however many years now, I don't know, I think 35 years in London, probably, 40 years in London. What do you remember about growing up in Penang and, and how, why was that? Was it influential? On well, I mean, the truth, is, the truth is it was a very short period of time because I was, I was only there for six months. I mean, the, the takeaway on that is that it's the same island um, that Jimmy Choo uh, was born in, or comes from. So, you know, it's sort of coincidence. Yeah, I mean, and, and, but what happened is I, I, then my parents were sent out to Malaysia again when I was sort of seven, eight, nine, and that did have an impact on me because it was sort of, I didn't really have much formal schooling, to be honest, until, until about the age of 10. Was there a British school there, Rupert? No, there the, 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 the was, but it was very sketchy. You know, it was, <laughs> it, it, yeah, it was a bit of an outpost for the sort of, you know, for the sort of, any sort of formal curriculum teaching, so... And so, what do you remember loving as a child? I mean, what, what were you interested free, in? I mean, just the freedom. I mean, just it's just. It, I mean, it was it was it was unstructured play. Mm. Was was basically what what it was all about. I mean, it was. I mean, we were from the, you know didn't really wear shoes. I was on the beach a lot. Learned how to sort of catch all sorts of animals. <laughs> be able to sort of you know I don't know swim daily in the sea. Then had a water ski. Then had a sort of, you know, it was it was it was it was a very free time. And for a sort of seven, eight, nine year old boy, it was heaven. Yeah. And then came back to the UK to a very very freezing cold <laughs> Fenland school. Do you remember when you first became aware of fashion or interested in it at all, and particular issues? I, I always had this sort of hunch. You know, I can remember when I, when I was even you know, I was sort of 10, 11, 12, You know, this is, there was a sort of I, I just had a, 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 it was a sort of feeling for the way things looked and the way things were made. And there was nothing specific. I didn't come from, you know, a, a, you know, a sort of fashion or particularly arty background. It was, it was just, but I just had a sort of hunch that, you know, I liked, I was very sort of, like a lot of kids, I think, you know, when they get it into their head, they want a certain thing, you know, it's largely around peer pressure or peer group think and but also that I was slightly ahead of the game I felt with things and picking up on things that latterly became sort of the thing to wear and I used to sort of seek things out. Was it always shoes or was it fashion altogether? No I mean it was it was shoes it was, I mean I remember I probably remember almost every pair of shoes I've ever owned <laughs> it just it just happened to have a sort of it happened to chime with me that that, that you know in, in, as it, and what happened is that i, I Basically, I didn't go down the sort of creative route at, in, in college. I went to university, got a general arts degree, but it wasn't it wasn't with any view to working in the creative industries. And I'm quite curious about you know the power of commercial creativity and worked in advertising, but it was sort of it never felt right. And it was only and but I was still had this feeling for the sort of 
it was fashion, but it was no, no in no serious way. Well, I mean, compared to the people who sort of, you know, went to art schools and made it their life, I was, I was completely not of that sort of crowd at all. And, and, and it was only sort of as a slight cry for help, I thought, I'm just miserable, I'm 30, <laughs> and, I, and I sort of hate what I'm doing, that I sort of really dug deep and went and sort of found out about a college in East London that you could learn how to make shoes at. And, that, and that's how it started, really. And so I then went to the age of 30, one I think two I hadn't really I hadn't designed a single shoe or anything before I was 30. Were you married at that time Rupert? No I wasn't married I was I was you know single and it was a great freedom because then it, obviously I could then explore fully and you know, I got to Italy and fell in love with being in Italy and you know worked with some amazing people there learned the language learned the sort of the, learned the way of working in, in Italian fashion and factories and that sort of underpins you know everything about how I do is that sort of small is that sort of small family run businesses you know I worked with Sergio Rossi and then um you know when in, in the sort of late noughties early noughties sorry you know 2000 2001 when it was a sort of really hot brand and Gianvito was you know working as sort of in the in the PR department <laughs> or you know some I don't know, he wasn't a designer but he was working with his dad to sort of on the table next to me and it was really you know and the, the, i learned all that sort of how you make shoes and how, the italian way from fat from, from family run businesses and did it connect to you immediately i mean was it were you definitely yeah as much about engineering i would imagine as beauty and and fashion yeah i mean it, you could see how you know from a fairly humble set of you know location people crafted these incredibly beautiful elegant shoes and every element of it is actually a really quite a quite a sort of a, a crunchy industrial process you know making heels is like you know there's nothing refined about making a very refined heel it's a piece of rolled steel encased in high density polyurethane i mean you know it's not sexy stuff <laughs> but you really need to know how to make those things making lasts out of wood and from scratch making you know going to tannery and seeing actually how leather really is made what's the difference between a good split of leather and what's a bad split of leather you know it's all each individual stage is very industrial and then that, that appealed to me because out of all the, i suppose it's like well, you know uh, architects getting to understand how buildings are made you know how bricks are made and how you know glasses you know it actually we went to where these places where the, where the component elements are made it's it's about as far removed from the end experience of what you know of a woman walking into a shop and putting on a pair of my shoes but that element of it appeals and i think you know, i learned from craftsmen rather than fashion types yeah and so how long were you with sergio well I think initially i was about 18 months i worked at bruno mali which was a brilliant brand at the, at the um in the in the sort of well the sort of that, that generation of great italian shoe brands um i mean that's bruno malio sort of most famous for i think oj yeah i mean actually they had a pair you no know, so but in fact they, they their women's wear their women's shoes were brilliant and their whole the factory was just it was just the most extraordinary place to, to, to work in because you were everything was under one roof and so you learned every single process and you had access and it was like a kid in a toy shop <laughs> i could just you know had three people full time looking after the magazine or just the leathers. Wow. So you, know, you could just wander around in a select any leather you wanted to be able to make a sample and any lasts. And, you know, you, so, you know, for a year, a combination of that and Brunamali was a great foundation on which to make really know how to make beautiful shoes. And so when did it occur to you that you wanted to do it yourself? It was after I'd been there. And I think, and then I started to understand the cycle, the fashion cycles, the seasonal cycles. And I realized if I was going to do it, I'd have to get a collection together for the start of the season. And it happened to be, you know, I, I decided in February, March at the time that I needed, so I needed to find a factory and I needed to get a collection ready for when market opened in September. And so, and I thought I'd give it a go and see what happened. If it didn't work, then I'd, I'd you know, have to think again. But I just thought I can. You know, get myself out to America and and, <laughs> and present the collection to, to you know in small hotel rooms exactly the land of the shoe buyers <laughs> yeah so it was Cynthia Marcus actually who gave me my first break I mean she was it was probably one of the last seasons and she was, I mean it was literally 
the change down the back of the sofa that, 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 that she said, <laughs> well, yeah, right, we'll give this guy a chance. But to me, it was absolutely, my God, they've only got bought the shoes, you know, and it was, it was, you know, they were in four Neiman's doors the next season. Like, wow. It was extraordinary. How many styles did you have that first, the, how many skews the first season? I think I had three, I think three stories of, of, of probably I had two or three styles in each because you're funding it from yourself. Yeah. You were just trying to, you know, so you got nine, possibly nine, nine or 12 shoes. And there were three, three, three stories. And how did you even know how to sell it? How did you know how to contact? Again, it's just research. <laughs> you made it, it up. Just, it was just <laughs> basically, yeah. I mean, I literally had to just, work out work it all out myself because I had no I had no you know I had no colleagues or people I'd ever worked with you know they were it was all in it was all in Italy it was all about you know how the sort of established brands had you know been doing it for years and I just you know, I just, <laughs> sort of just I really had to just work it out I literally just pick up the phone I remember phoning someone at Saks literally just saying can I be put through to the shoe but what's her name <laughs> you know his name yeah I got the name and I sort of phoned her I said hi you don't know me but I mean, I've made some shoes and I'd really like to come and show them to you. And she's like, really? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm actually staying with a friend in New York and I'd just like to come and shoot. You know, it was like as innocent as that. Yeah. And how long until you met Andrew? Because that, that seemed like it changed. Well, that was probably, yeah, that did. It changed when, I mean, because we were both doing the trade shows. He was at Emma Hope, yep. And, he, and you must have been across the he, booth from him. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I think that's how I met you. <laughs> yeah. You were buying her shoes. It was you were. I was still picking up the crumbs from other brands, really, in terms of you know, the buyers would be coming in, and and you know, I'd you know, it would be sweating bullets trying to you know because you only had the you know you had that brief moment. You know, you'd work up that time. You had four days at Linea Pele, or sorry, Premier Class, yeah. in which to sort of sell. And if you didn't get any orders, you know, I mean, that was it was another that was another. I mean, we, it was before the pre or the pre season, so you literally had to wait six months before the next one came. <laughs> So it was quite, it was quite, it was quite critical to get, yeah. And, you know, my first season, I remember my first getting there and literally picking up one order in four <laughs> days from some sort of drunk Belgian woman who, who <laughs> when I contacted her, had, knew, had no knowledge that she placed an order. I think I've seen that woman. <laughs> yeah. I remember a really big milestone after carrying your collection for several years, at least, when you bought your factory. Yeah. Tell me about that and what was that like and how far along was that? Well, it, it was, I mean, it, again, it was, a, it was a comp, I mean, things coming together slightly in the sense that I was so reliant when you write at the beginning, of the, when you start out, you're so reliant on the factory being, being, doing what they say they're going to do. Because if you get bumped, it's so easy when someone's making 500 pairs of shoes for the entire season. It just makes no sense for a factory because the factory wants high volumes of the same shoe, right. and you're making microscopic runs of lots of complicated shoes. <laughs> and so, it was it was it was because I had a relationship, and I was out in Italy a lot, and I could speak the language, and I you know, they clearly understood I was serious and desperate um, <laughs> that that they took, took me seriously. I had a very good relationship with the sort of foreman, the mate, the shoemaker, and he announced one day that the people who own the factory were having to sell up you know classic italian story the tax man had finally caught up with them <laughs> and they were having to liquidate everything and 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 he effectively said look you know if you made them a crazy offer they'd probably take it because they've got no options and i was like really i thought no you know i can barely you know i can barely get from one season to the next how much am i going to buy a factory in italy and anyway long story we managed to find a sort of you know some soft money and invest someone who'd just come into a bit of money and believed in me and so between us we we effectively did the due diligence and bought this factory or bought a controlling interest in the factory and you know it was a it was a big step change it was the time Andrew joined me it was a time we got our store in Mayfair it was a really you know it was a really good time you know I think independent shoemakers were a real thing it, we, 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 it, we were ahead of the curve in terms of you know the big brands the big clothing brands the ready-to-wear brands had really got into shoes in quite a big in quite the way they're in now right and so there was it was it really had there was a real sense of of sort of momentum and it was you know we had some great great years of, of you know building this factory up and spending lots of time there and you know just building this building the factory and it being this sort of vertical um, operation which was you know it was, it was it was exciting did that change sort of the way that you i mean you had different responsibilities i would imagine 
at that point as well. Yeah. And what was that like? I mean, you you basically had to learn on the job. I mean, because there was no amount of preparation that you know you just had to deal with people on a much bigger scale. You you had double concerns in the sense you weren't only talking to your own people in London and you know Andrew and his team and the shop team and building an e-commerce business. Um, you know, working out how to run you know marketing and PR and um, you know, trying to build relationships, particularly in the states where we you know. We hired a PR agency over there, which I worked with very closely for about three or four years. And then you had this other thing, which was you were responsible for a, for a factory in another language, another culture, and all this sort of thing. And so it was great because everything was growing. Everything was everything was on the up. You know, it was all about, you know, how what, what you know how 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 well are we going to do next year, and mm. what what can we do, and whether we open stores or where we open stores. So it was exciting, and that sort of that, but wait, wait, is this is this pre two thousand eight? Uh, it was yeah, it was pre two thousand and eight, and then we and then and then and then it sort of. Hit. But I think we were small enough. We were small enough to sort of we were on the up enough to weather that. Yeah. So we 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 you know I, I think a lot of people got caught who had a lot of inventory or they were you know at a different stage of their 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 journey. But we we managed to sort of it was a big bump in the road, but we were sort of going fast enough, I suppose, to sort of get over it. <laughs> And when we developed a bit of franchise business in, in Hong Kong, it was very exciting, built around the sort of pebble idea and sort of gilding and you know, making very sort of really high end shoes. I mean, we got to, you know, we got to a point where these were sort of like they were almost like pieces of jewellery, this market. And we were we were working very closely with a partner who had, had very big ambitions to roll this out into this mainland China and the point, you know, so that, that was all going on as well. Yeah. And then speaking of owning a factory, talk to me a little bit about the pandemic and sort of how that affected your factory and your business and how you got through well, it. Well, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it, 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 was, it, was, it was, you know, I mean, it, it couldn't have been designed better to to screw up a, <laughs> a, a luxury shoe business. Because yes. <laughs> particularly someone that was that had that had a big exposure to Hong Kong and China. Right. We, we were making between sort of twelve and fifteen thousand pairs of shoes a year for that market, um, and then um, you know, but then we were manufacturing in Italy, which was the first European country to shut down. Yeah. Which then, we, and then we had you know we had stores and staff on you know long term contracts in the UK. So all these things were sort of like were sort of very very difficult, and then um, and then we and but through a series of good luck and I don't know. The gods sort of shining, looking down on us. We managed to get through that, and there was, you know, the, the, the core cast, the core team, were were you know were amazing, and we managed to shave things down and get back to the essence of what what we were sort of all about. And the factory, we managed to sort of save the factory through a good fortune, and I managed to sell the factory to someone who is a very very good, was an experience of. Factory owner who you know has a, you know there was a very it was a very smart so I became rather than have being responsible for a you know, workforce in a factory I I you know I've, I've become the customer or you know as I was in the first place <laughs> so I've suddenly become this sort of red carpet customer overnight <laughs> from this like hat with VIP owner that you know was, <laughs> so yeah so it was so it was a sort of nice sobering experience but you know we, we, we came through it we came through it well i think also one of the strangest things was your collection was one of the strongest that i saw in the entire market post pandemic it was so beautiful sparkling joyful but also really the essence of what you do it, it looked like mm. it looked like rupert from when i first when i first saw it yeah. that first time yeah i mean it, it well that's lovely to hear because it you know it was <laughs> You know, we really had to sort of, we really had to sort of pull out the stops to make it work because we we were work, we were working in incredibly sort of restricted ways because we couldn't travel. I couldn't travel to, to to Italy as freely as I wanted to. We were having to do everything on Zoom and you know DHL and you know just you know we were we were on sort of WhatsApp messaging <laughs> and you know I, I I did an entire collection without ever going to the factory and and that was one of the, you know one of the post pandemic collection it was like wow it's here and i literally had nothing physically <laughs> to do you know i've had to sort of dig deep into the archive referencing what i was doing you know other you know so yeah re, sort of revisiting the handwriting rather than coming up with anything absolutely brand new new structure and development so it was a sense of just i suppose really just sort of revisiting my, my what i did 
but I was, but I was known for, I suppose, you know, sufficiently deep archive now for me to you yeah. know, confidently go back and, you know, look again. What is your life like outside of work? I know you have a lot of little boys. It's quite relentless. I mean, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know, I think because I've done so much time, so to speak, in the business, that there are certain shorthands I can use to get things done efficiently, which allows me to be able to sort of be a present parent. Because I know fashion is pretty unsympathetic to that family life. But I suppose I've designed it probably by accident more than design to be able to do both without compromise. How do you make the space to to be inspired, to find in- inspiration? I mean, one of the great things about the fashion, the fashion calendar, is that you know, the re- it is that is a calendar. You have to do certain <laughs> things at certain times of the year, otherwise you miss the market. So it's useful. It's like it's like I don't know. It's like you're working to deadlines, and so <laughs> you 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 just put your diary together and you carve out thinking time at specific times of the year and you stick to that you know it's relentless you're doing four collections a year you know there is certain periods of you know certain periods of the year where that's all I do which is design but it may be for an intense period of time but I won't that's all that but I'm not doing anything else right so I'm so I can work for two weeks solidly on a collection and actually that's a lot of time if you if you're working with a really tight team that know exactly what you're talking about and referencing, you know, existing structures, existing techniques, existing, you know, vocabulary. You don't have to re- you don't have to reinvent the wheel every season. Um, and also, you, you can't really because you've got a, you've got a you know you've got a, a, a you've got a sort of signature look or what you're known for. You can't deviate too much from that. Um, uh, on the core collection, obviously, you're expected to do things that you know that, that sort of add interest and show you've got sort of crazy spark. And you can tell stories in a different way, but you can't, you know, I, I mean, I, I, we, 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 we re-put the archive together again last week in the summer. You know, it's just over under 2,000 different <laughs> shoe designs that I've got. And so you know, as, as, as an archive, to actually just go through that is a real luxury to sort of revisit things that I did 12 years ago. It's what, you know, it's what the houses do at the moment, you know, that you get a new creation director into you know, Bauman or whatever, they, they just go through the art. Right. I mean, it's, you know, I do it in a sort of miniature way. You know, that's what I, that's what I do. And so that speeds things up. Yeah. We know what works. We know our customer. We know we can be a little more precise about, about what we're doing. We're not trying to, we're not trying to sort of boost the, the business threefold because someone has bought it. Right. You know, there is a very sort of dedication. There's, again, it comes back to that sort of old school learning that I had when these privately owned, family run Italian shoe businesses. That sort of underpins really my attitude to, to, to you know, how I work because mm. I, know no, I know no different. I've never worked for a large, you know, pri- you know whatever, you know, corporately owned company that's got shareholders breathing down your neck and, you know, expectations partnerships that you know drive them commercials of it it is it is a sort of you know it's a it's a modest but highly creative little business it's a mighty little business do you have um (laughs) (laughs) do you have a favorite failure yeah that's a good question it's endless failure (laughs) that that, that's what you that's sort of what you you're dealing with you know you're you know I think if you come up, you design something, the sort of the, 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 the potency of the idea sort of suddenly overwhelms you to start with. You think that's a great, that's, that's sort of, you know, I, I love that. I mean, I remember you know, on a very, very small scale doing this all this bamboo story. Now, I thought it was a really lovely idea. I mean, we made these leather, we got it stamped, we got it cropped, we got it made into, into, to look like bamboo. Yeah. And of course, no, I, and literally we didn't sell a stick. No, <laughs> yeah, no. Like, no, no one got I think it. I bought like, one. Yeah. I think I bought a style. Oh, no, 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 I, think, I think you. I think you bought the. I think you bought the first round. Which is the second round, when I really inflated it all and made it sort of super size, and then literally, I, Andrew, I, I, I was like, yeah, let's use it. Let's use this. Is the, this is the poster child of the campaign. You know, let's really. You know, let's really. It's, it's going to go mad. People are going to think I'm a genius. And yet, you know, it's like not a single person picked it up. You're ahead of your time. Well, <laughs> You know, it's just, uh, 
but 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 that on a sort of product level it happens all the time because you're you know you're, you're you, you 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 always think God, we've cracked it we've really cracked it <laughs> and then you know, the world's just not like that and the, and but i think you know there's failures there's yeah i mean i think just coming through stuff um that hasn't worked or or, or hasn't worked as well as we hoped is is the sort of most successful failure you know just not yeah i mean just just it's just how you react. It's not nothing's a failure in its sense that it's a sort of full stop. It's just like, oh, well, we can't do that, or we won't do that again. We'll do it. We'll do it differently. Mm. <laughs> and so, you know, you, you, I think if you, I think the danger is if you, if you, if you think it's an outright failure, you just think, well, there's no way out of this. It's a, it's failed. I mean, obviously, if the, if the bank manager just turns up and gives you one of our money back. <laughs> You know, then then probably that's that that's the sort of end of the line, but that hasn't happened yet. So, <laughs> what are you most proud of, and what you've created, and in, in this career? Uh, I mean, I think, I think I think quite frankly, you know, being independent and being you know still doing what I yeah. did twenty years ago <laughs> in pretty much the same form is 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 the thing I'm most proud of. I mean, you know, I can still. Funny enough, I've just been in Notting Hill. I'm just wandering around. Just you know, Fridays, I tend to like to you know, just go off and just look at stuff and and it's great there's a great sort of flea market and but they have a couple of stalls there and one of the things is sort of is second hand and it's always quite fun to go in and just look through all these designer brands and try and find your own shoes in amongst <laughs> all the Balenciagas and Pradas <laughs> and stuff and I because I have to manage my sort of ego and expectations quite carefully because if I wander in and there's a load of shoes the brands I think who the hell are they <laughs> why am I here and that's why I keep rummaging and I get further deeper and deeper into the store until eventually oh <laughs> There I am, Rupert Sanson. I'm still alive. I'm still I don't know. No, I, I think it's the opposite, actually. I think that you probably won't find a lot of your shoes there because people keep them because they're so comfortable and they're so beautiful. So. Very flattering. <laughs> very, very honest. Flattering, very I, honest. <laughs> well, thank you. But I did, but well, best of both worlds. I, I found just enough okay, good. to keep my ego okay, good. You know, check. You know, in check. <laughs> Did you have a prom? Do, do, do you have proms at your boarding school in England? Mm, not in quite the same way. Okay. I mean, surprise, surprise, I organised one. Okay. I hired a boat and got everyone together and we dressed up and sailed down the river through the to, through Cambridge <laughs> on this extraordinary boat called the Viscountess Berry and we had a jazz band. And, and what did you wear? Probably some terrible pink bow tie <laughs> and stuff, you know, and stuff, you know. I was really like dressed like some terrible 50 year old man thinking I was really really sophisticated and what shoes what shoes good question what shoes I would have probably worn some you know some black it would have been I would have tried to be really grown up about it all <laughs> and not cool I'd just been like some young James Bond what would he wear you know but um yeah it would have been some black shiny shoes right. to go with my <laughs> pink bow tie I love it Rupert thank you so much Thank you. See you. Bye. Bye. What We Wore is produced by Capital and Balto Creative Media. The original song, Someone So Enchanting, was composed and performed by Britt Drazda. queencitypodcastnetwork.com